Okay, so we're going to be doing Hebrews 2, 5 to 18. Before we can do that, uh, we are going to talk about a bunch of different topics that's going to take us kind of very quickly through much of the rest of the book of Hebrews uh, because all these thematic concepts are going to be uh, kind of important to understanding what the preacher of the book of Hebrews is talking about. So we're going to talk about a couple of big ticket items, uh, the first of which is perfection and what perfection means to the preacher and what it means to us and how perfection relates to the ordination of a priesthood. And then we're going to talk about the seven stages of consecration of priests. And then we're going to talk about perfection again as a rite of passage in the book of Hebrews. And that's going to lead us finally to uh, Christians as co-priests with Christ. And uh, you may be familiar with uh, Luther's coining the term the priesthood of all believers. Uh, He wrote a a short book about that. uh, And we Lutherans love to bandy that term around, priesthood of all believers. But what exactly does that mean? Is everybody a priest? What, What exactly did Luther mean? What exactly does the author of Hebrews mean when he talks about us being co priests? So we're going to go through all of these different topics because they're important to understand what the preacher is getting at. And in order to do that, we've got to go back to the Old Testament, so we probably won't be in Hebrews at all tonight. We are going to look at the institution of the ordination of priests and then the enactment of the rite in Leviticus. So we should look first at Exodus chapter 29. And I'm happy to read, but if somebody else wants to read, feel free. And it's the whole, I believe it's the whole chapter. Most of the chapter, 29, 1 to 37. And I am King Jamesing it tonight because I want my uh, second and third person uh, okay. pronouns. So, All right, well, I'll start it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and then when I stop, somebody else pick it up. Did you say you were reading it? Well, I, I, I will whenever he wants me to. Yeah, I'll read a few, and then someone just pick it up. So we're going to read Exodus 29, 1 to 37. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments, and put upon Aaron the coat, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons, and put coats upon them. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock, and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger, and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the inwards, and the caul that is above the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, and burn them upon the altar. But burn the bull's flesh and hide it, and its hide and its offal outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Take one of the rams, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on its head. Slaughter it, and take the blood, and sprinkle it against the altar on all sides. Cut the ram into pieces, and wash the inner parts and the legs, 
putting them with the head and other pieces. Then burn the entire ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to the Lord by fire. Take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on its head. Slaughter it, take some of its blood, and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron and his son, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Then sprinkle blood against the altar on all sides, and take some of the blood on the altar, and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments, and on his son and their garments. Then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. Then take the fat from the male sheep, the fat tail, and the fat that covers the inner organs. In addition, take the best part of the liver, both kidneys and the fat around them, and the right thigh. This is the male sheep to be used in appointing priest. Then take the basket of bread that you made without yeast, which you put before the Lord. From it, take a loaf of bread, a cake made with olive oil, and a wafer. Put all of these in the hands of Aaron and his sons, and tell them to present them as an offering to the Lord. Then take them from their hands and burn them on the altar with the whole burnt offering. This is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Its smell is pleasing to the Lord. Then take the breast of the male sheep used to appoint Aaron as priest and present it before the Lord as an offering. This part of the animal will be your share. Set aside the breast and the thigh of the sheep that were used to appoint Aaron and his sons as priests. These parts belong to them. They are to be the regular share which, is, which the Israelites will always give to Aaron and his sons. It is the gift the Israelites must give to the Lord from their fellowship offerings. The holy clothes made for Aaron will belong to his descendants so that they can wear these clothes when they are appointed as priests. Aaron's son, who will become high priest after Aaron, will come to the meeting tent to serve in the holy place. He is to wear these clothes for seven days. Take the male sheep used to appoint priests and boil its meat in a place that is holy. Then at the entrance of the meeting tent, Aaron and his sons must eat the meat of the sheep and the bread that is in the basket. They should eat these offerings that were used to remove their sins and to make them holy when they were made priests. But no one else is to eat them because they are holy things. If any of the meat from the sheep or any of the bread is left the next morning, it must be burned. It must not be eaten because it is holy. Do all these things that I commanded you to do to Aaron and his sons and spend seven days appointing them. Each day you are to offer a bull to remove the sins of Aaron and his sons, so they will be given for service to the Lord. Make the altar ready for service to the Lord, and pour oil on it to make it holy. Spend seven days making the altar ready for service to God and making it holy. Then the altar will become very holy, and anything that touches it must be holy. Good, thank you. Okay, so two verses I just want to point out real quick. The most important verse, one of the most important verses, is verse 37, the last one. Seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. And then the other one is verse 33, because it's interesting how the different translations render it. And King James has, And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to concentrate to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. I like how King James made a distinction between uh, consecration and sanctification. So we'll stop there for a minute.
and this word uh, perfection that we're going to be talking about. Uh, in Latin, it's consumare, which is where we get our word consummate uh, that the King James likes to use. Uh, so consumare, to be consecrated. Uh, in Greek, it's, let's see, tell I, oh, ooh, got it like, tell I, tell I, oh, tell I, oh, it's got two different long O's <laughs> in the end of the word. Tell I, oh, means to make perfect. And then Luther translated that as uh, volkommen machen, which is to make complete. So to be consecrated, to make perfect, to make complete. And they're going to use words related to that word telos in Greek, the end or the goal, uh, which is going to be a significant theological term throughout the book. Uh, telos, we have the word in uh, English called the telomere. It's the little things at the ends of your chromosomes. Every time your chromosomes come apart and then they divide and they go back together, it's like the little rope you tie on the end of a rope that keeps the rope from coming unraveled. And every time you untie it, tie it back, it gets one link shorter. Uh, so the telomeres are built in uh, lifespan programming, basically. You know, we can only reproduce ourselves so many times and then it just stops working and we fall apart and die, uh, which works out to be, I believe, is that the one? It works out, yeah, it was like 120, 125 years is about how long we can reproduce ourselves, which is interesting because that's exactly what the Bible says he changed our lifespan to. And if we ever figured out how this is just random thing, uh, if we ever figure out how to beat the telomere deal with our chromosomes, which they're working on, uh, they figured out how long, about how long we would be able to live if we did not have that built-in uh, lifespan switch. Turns out it's about a thousand years. Kind of like, you know, Methuselah. Hmm. So I'm not saying anything, but, you know, it's kind of suspicious that the Bible kind of supports some of the science as they discover it. I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. Probably not. I wouldn't bet on it. Okay, so this idea of the end, the goal, perfection, uh, making perfect, and especially this volkommen machen that Luther liked, this making complete. Uh, we talk about that a lot, and we'll talk about it a lot in Hebrews, because we talk about, as Lutherans, we talk about the now and the not yet. And people always go, what's the now and the not yet? Well, the now is all the benefits we have as you know, children of God because of what Christ did for us. But it's not perfect yet. It's not complete yet. We don't get that till the not yet, till we get to heaven. So that's when that perfection will become complete, when it will be consummated. So all these words kind of all come to bear on that. Okay, so that was uh, to refresh our memories about how uh, the priests are consecrated, how they are ordained, you could say. And then we look at the uh, look at Leviticus eight, and it shows us how it is enacted. And basically, it's going to be everything that God just told them to do in uh, Exodus. They're going to do in Leviticus. So I'll just read through that real quick. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all that congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the consecration. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put upon him the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod upon him and girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith. And he put the breastplate upon him. Also he put in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim. 
And he put the mitre upon his head. Also upon the mitre, even upon its forefront, did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. That's uh, Exodus 28. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the bullock for the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering and he slew it. And Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. And he took all the fat that was upon the inwards at the call above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and Moses burned it upon the altar. But the bullock and his hide, his flesh and his dung, he burnt with fire without the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. And he brought the ram for the burnt offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram and he killed it. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about and he cut the ram into pieces and so on and so forth. And then it talks about the ram. And then down verse 24, and he brought Aaron's sons and Moses put the blood upon the tip of their right ear and upon the thumbs of their right hands and upon the great toes of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about and took the fat and the rump and all the fat that was upon the inwards and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and the right shoulder. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake and a cake of oiled bread and one wafer and put them on the fat and upon the right shoulder. And he put all upon Aaron's hands and upon his son's hands and waved them for a wave offering before the Lord. And Moses took them from off their hands and burnt them on the altar upon the burnt offering. They were consecrations for a sweet savor. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. For the ram of consecration, it was Moses' part as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses took of the anointing ale And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his son's garments with him and sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. And Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and there eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecrations as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. And he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do to make an atonement for you. Therefore, ye shall abide. Therefore, ye shall abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord that ye die not. For so I am commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Okay. So by this rite of ordination, Moses consecrated Aaron and his sons. So this act of consecration, this act of purifying, of perfecting, of making things holy, qualifies them to serve the living God in the the tabernacle, later the temple. And then our own perfection, our own holiness that we receive qualifies us to serve God in the heavenly realm. And again, the not yet when we die and we go to heaven, but then in the now, as heaven comes down to us in the divine service, that little time that's outside of time and space when heaven comes to earth, uh, particularly in the Lord's Supper, that is when we participate in that marriage feast of the Lamb, which has no end, that ongoing uh, worship service in heaven that never ends. Um, so if we look at Hebrews 9.9, 9, let's see what that says. Someone look at 9.9, 9, someone look at 9.14. And then somebody look at 10, 1 to 2. So 
So someone read 9-9. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him to perform the sacrifice perfect in regard to the conscience. Okay, the conscience. Remember that. Uh, who's got 914? His blood will make our consciences pure from useless acts, so we may serve the living God. Okay, good. And then who's got 10, 1, and 2? For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, it would not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sins. Okay. So we have this idea of uh, the cleansing of the conscience, and we have this, okay, how much more so than all this stuff Moses was told by God to do for, for Aaron and his sons, for consecrating them, purifying them so they would be fit to serve, okay? And how much more than is what Christ has done for us, how much greater than all that is, you know, who offered himself up once for everyone uh, as that spotless, uh, you know, that sacrifice without spot or blemish. You know, so if the if the flesh could be purified by sprinkling of blood and the sacrificing of those animals, how much greater then is the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us? So in that respect, the Christian congregation has been made perfect. So, you know, so we are simultaneously saint and sinner. We're still sinners, but we are declared righteous, fully holy, before God because of what Jesus did for us, but we're still waiting for that perfection to become a reality. Uh, and again, that happens when we die because that is when our sanctification becomes complete. Someone would look at 1139 to 40. Would they be made perfect? Right. All right, so we're waiting for that, that final completion of sanctification. So just like in Exodus 29, how we heard how Moses consecrated Aaron and his sons back in, or actually we haven't gotten there yet, back in Hebrews 2.11, it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, and we'll come back to that point uh, more than once. So because of what Christ did, uh, we're declared just as holy as Christ right alongside him. So he is not ashamed to call us brothers. And that, that is a big uh, point that we'll get to when we start talking about being co-priests uh, with Christ. So Jesus consecrates us. Okay. So this idea of purification and making perfect and making complete is the ritual or the rite of uh, priestly ordination in the Old Testament, and it is also priestly ordination for us in the New Covenant in the New Testament. Uh, as Jesus declares us holy and complete and perfect in order to, for us to be able to draw near to God to worship him in his holy uh, heavenly temple. 
So we've got seven stages of consecration that we saw. And I'm going to go through this kind of quick. But, so in Leviticus 8, 6, we saw that Moses washed Aaron and his sons with water from the most holy font. So washing, washing with water was the first thing we think of. Whenever something washed with water, that's what? Baptism. baptism, right. Okay, so we are washed with the pure water of baptism, and you, we'll get to that in Hebrews 10, 22. And then Moses clothed Aaron uh, with the diadem, with the crown, and the holy vestments. And now, uh, Hebrews 2, 9 to 10, uh, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So, uh, just as Moses clothed or crowned Aaron with the crown and with the holy vestments, Christ was crowned with glory and honor by the Father. And that gets back to that part we talked about earlier where it's like, why is this guy going on and on about Jesus being, you know, brought lower than the angels when he's higher than the angels and now the angels have nothing to do with ruling over us. Like, that was kind of weird. But that's why. So now he was brought lower than the angels to suffer, to die, so that he could make us perfect through his suffering. And because of that, he is crowned with glory and honor. Then we saw in Leviticus, Moses anointed the tabernacle, the altar, and the head of Aaron with the holy oil. And then Hebrews 1.9 we saw, uh, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So that's God anointing Christ uh, with the oil of gladness because he is the anointed one. That's what Christ means. And then Leviticus 8.13, Moses clothed Aaron's sons with their sacred vestments. And then uh, next verse, Moses offers the bull as their sin offering, using the blood to purify and consecrate the altar. Then in Hebrews, we will see Jesus offered himself as a voluntary sin offering for the purification of his disciples and all people. And that's all over the book of Hebrews. That's in 1.3, 7.27, 9, 13 to 14, 10, 19, 13, 12. It's all over talking about, you know, Jesus being that atoning sacrifice. Okay, then in Leviticus 8, 18 to 21, Moses offered a ram as a burnt offering for the completion of their ordination, just as Jesus offered his body for the consecration of his disciples. And by disciples, we mean all of his followers. And that we will see in Hebrews 10.10 and 10.14. So 10.10, by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And then we also saw that Moses offered a ram and some of the blood, or I'm sorry, the ram and some of the bread as their ordination offering, which they had to consume. And that he smeared some of the blood on their, uh, their right ears, their right thumbs, and their right big toe. I'm not exactly sure why those specific parts. I have to research that a little bit. I couldn't find anything. Right is good, left is bad. Probably. Probably. Does that have something to do with the foreshadowing of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God? All good? Possibly. That's very likely. Yeah, so I'll try to find out specifically why, like why the ear, the thumb, and the big toe. That's kind of strange, but okay. And then the rest is poured out against the altar. Okay. 
And then he filled their hands with the portions that belonged to the priests from the peace offerings. And then, so he then perfected them for their service by burning their portion of the sacrifice on the altar. Just as we will see in Hebrews 9 and 10, how we Christians have been perfected for this whole heavenly uh, service. 9-9 uh, again. Uh, which was a figure for the time when then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. <clears throat> and then, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then, they would not, why would they have not ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of their sins. And then again, 14, for by one offering it perfected forever them that are sanctified. So then we see kind of the end of the old sacrificial system. Right? So when the Messiah comes, the sacrificial system is obsolete. Of course, the Jews keep on offering them until the destruction of the temple, and then literally the sacrificial system was over. That's when all of that ended. Right, so Jesus' once for all sacrifice perfects us for heavenly service. And then, of course, Leviticus 8.30, where he sprinkled the anointing oil mixed with holy blood from the altar on the priests and on their vestments. We'll see throughout the middle part of Hebrews how Christians have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus and are sanctified by that blood. And then he instructed the Aaron and his sons to eat the holy meal with the meat and the bread from the ordination offering. Just as we eat the food which comes from Christ's altar in the Lord's Supper. So to make perfect in Hebrews is a technical term. So making perfect is a term for the ordination of Jesus as high priest. So it's not about our ordination as little individual priests, but his ordination as the high priest. And then we will see as we go further uh, how we're even better than priests. It's like, it's, don't need that anymore because of what he has done for us. And I pointed out that verse that talked about the seven days because that Old Testament ordination, it didn't just happen in one day or like when I got ordained, you know, it's like an hour and a half service and then, then you are one, it's done, right? It doesn't take long. But that ordination in the Old Testament took a week of doing all this ritual washing and sacrificing and eating and everything and wearing their holy garments and then culminated in their standing daily in the divine service at the tabernacle. And that makes sense because that is in a little picture of foreshadowing what has happened to us in the new covenant. So our perfection in Christ begins in our baptisms, right? And so we'll become part of God's family. And that perfection begins, but it does not reach its fulfillment until we die. So it's not a one day, five seconds, sprinkled some water on the kid and said the baptism formula, and now he's a child of God and everything is done. It's not done, it's just begun. So that is a daily living out of that baptismal our baptismal, well, our baptismal vows we make, but our, our, the baptismal vow God makes to us that he has sealed us with his name. And that perfection does not happen until we reach heaven. That's when we get that fulfillment, we get that uh, perfection, we get that completion. Okay, makes sense? All right, so this idea of perfection and consecration all has to do with priestly things and it all applies to Christ because he's the one that was well he was perfect to begin with but he everything the father asked him to do he did perfectly 
And because of that, that is why he is again lifted higher than the angels, why he is our great high priest. And we'll come back to a lot of these things. Uh, and then the idea is that perfection is a rite of passage. So this idea of perfection uh, is a rite of passage for Christians. It was a rite of passage for the priests under the Old Covenant. So I'm not sure how I want to go over this yet. But probably the easiest thing to do. So the, the rite of passage is... Yeah, it's, it's going to show us the, the steps we go through, so let's try this. So there's these four steps, four, six steps, there's six steps for this uh, idea of rites of passage uh, for perfection. So we look at our preliminary state, what the rite of passage is, what the final state or the goal is of it, and then uh, who does that actually apply to. So the first one is, and these are kind of arbitrary, but this is the uh, author of the Concordia Commentary on Hebrews divided it up this way. I thought it was kind of neat. So the first preliminary state is God's firstborn son has priestly status. It's like, okay. So the rite of passage is preparation for ministry through suffering, beginning with baptism. So it begins, everything begins at baptism. And the final goal is, you know, even for Christ, it began with his baptism. So he had a sinner's baptism in the Jordan, even though he was sinless. But he experienced everything we experienced. So he was baptized in the Jordan. Immediately the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. So his, his uh, rite of passage, so to speak, was his wilderness experience uh, with the devil which he, of course, conquered fully. So the final state of that is Jesus has anointed our high priest and king. And that applies to us as he is the perfecter of our faith. So if we look at 2.10, I know this is, is kind of abstract, but it will make sense as we go through the rest of the book. So 2.10 says, for it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things and bring many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So he uh, was made perfect for us, the perfect high priest and king for us by his suffering. And then 5, 7 to 10 says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto the him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then 7.28 says... For the law which maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So you have, you know, you have these Old Testament, Old Covenant laws you had to go through to be consecrated a priest, but the son is consecrated forever. You, know, you only had to do it once for everyone. And then... That was 728, right? Uh, 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. I think ESV has perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, I really think that right, that is what's going to be with the right ear and the right thumb and the right toe. I think you're right. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so we look unto Jesus as the author and perfecter of faith. So that is what he is for us. That's our first rite of passage. 
is becoming faithful. Okay, and then another preliminary state we find ourselves in is um, we have an infant immaturity without discernment. So we have an immature faith, right? We don't discern the things that are God's. We still think of things in a very human way. So the rite of passage for that is we receive our training. You know, in the, we have Sunday school, we have catechism class confirmation, right? So we go through that or adult instruction uh, when people come into the church when they're older. Uh, so you have that period of training where you come and reach eventually an adult maturity where you actually have spiritual discernment, where you can start to see okay, how these things are actually operating in our lives. You know, how is Jesus perfecting me? Slowly, <laughs> right? But, but how, is he, how is it, how you could see where it, when it happens? You can see it happening in others. So who would be the people uh, that this would be, this preliminary state ending in adult maturity with spiritual discernment would be the catechumens. So we will talk about that from chapter 5, verse 11 through 6, 3. We'll talk about uh, training and the catechumens. So the, and you'll see right there through chapter 5, chapter 6, they're still talking about high priests. So you're going to have this language about priests all the way through the book. So uh, the catechumens... The way the divine service was structured in the early church, uh, they basically would have, kind of like the way our service is divided, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the way our service is divided now, we have the service of the word, and then we have the service of the sacrament. And you see how like, okay, the service can end right there before communion. And that's what the short Sunday service is basically. It goes right to the Lord's Prayer of Benediction and we go home. Uh, the way the church service was set up in the early church, so if you had non-members or members who were not, uh, that had not been examined, that had not been admitted yet to the Lord's table, they left at that point. It was like, okay, that was called, basically it was called the service of the catechumens. So they, when you're still a learner and you're not yet admitted to the Lord's table, you got sent home. You didn't even sit and watch. That wasn't for you yet. So it was just for those who had been admitted to the Lord's table, they would continue with the Lord's Supper and then end the service that way. Uh, so you didn't even get to see it. And we still see that division today, the way it has the service of the Word, and then boom, service of the sacrament. And the two parts are hinged together by the Lord's Prayer, usually. So, you know, give us the, the Lord's Prayer comes right at the end of the service of the Word, and then we pray, give us this day our daily bread, and right after that, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is right up against the words of institution, usually in the liturgy. Okay, so going from infant immaturity without discernment to adult maturity with spiritual discernment refers to the catechumens. So now the next preliminary state we can find ourselves in is unclean people with a bad conscience. So conscience. The author of Hebrews is very, very Lutheran. He talks about conscience all the time, and so did Luther. Uh, so the rite of passage for people who are unclean is being cleansed, right? So you have unclean people with a bad conscience, cleansed with the blood of Jesus, and now they are people of faith who can come near to God. The idea of this consecrating, making perfect, is what allows you to approach God without intermediaries. You had to have the priests offer your sin offerings. You didn't do that yourself. You might have brought the animal, but they killed it. They offered it for you. Uh, you did not bring your sin to the table with God directly. And, and you'll see that as we continue talking about priests and the Levites and the high priest. You know, not uh, not all Levites were priests, but all priests are Levites, right? So you had degrees of what they did to serve. You know, everybody had to be a Levite to serve in the tabernacle or in the temple. But some were just Levites, some were priests, and then one was the high priest, and he could go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and hopefully not die, 
and offer the sin offering for the people. Uh, so they had degrees of their closeness to God, literally, because in the most holy place, it's where the Ark of the Covenant was, it's where the glory cloud would come down and rest on the mercy seat, right there in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest had access to that, and that was only one day a year that he could do that. And then the regular priests couldn't go that far. They could approach the holy the holy place, absolutely not go in the most holy place. And we saw what happened to people who did. They died. That's why they had to tie a rope around him. They would tie a rope around him before he went in because if he died, if he did something to anger God and God struck him down, the next guy couldn't go in to get his body, so they had to pull him out by the rope. <laughs> That's why they did that. Because literally, you could say something wrong, God's going to strike you down because you don't mess around in the most holy place. Now, were Aaron and his sons Levites? Yes. Okay, so people are cleansed with the blood of Jesus, and now they are people of faith who can come near to God. So that is the people with the clean conscience and the people with access to the Lord. So a clean conscience doesn't mean you don't feel guilty about anything. A clean conscience means I'm, I know I am bold to approach my God directly because I know I have that access because Jesus gave it to me. He died for that for me. So I don't have to pray through priests or high priest or whatever. I can go right to the source. The only intercessor I need is Jesus. So when you're unclean and when you have bad conscience, you don't think God could possibly listen to the likes of you. Again, through teaching and through our baptismal regeneration, now, okay, we have the faith and we have the confidence to boldly, that's why we say in the liturgy, you know, you know, believing in your promises, we are bold to pray and then we pray the Lord's Supper or pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we're bold because you didn't approach God like that. Nothing good came of that in the Old Testament, but this isn't the Old Testament. This is the New Covenant. Jesus tore that all down. When he died on Good Friday, that curtain over against the, holy of, the most holy place in the temple was torn in two to show us you have direct access to God. You don't need all this stuff anymore. So now that curtain is gone. There, that division, that gulf has been been closed up. Uh, and we see that in 719. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And then 101. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the com comers thereunto perfect. So basically, every year you had to go through this. Every year they had to put the sins of the people on the scapegoat and send them out to the devil in the wilderness to, to die. Uh, but then our scapegoat, Jesus, died once for all time. So now we have that, that certain hope that we don't have to go through all these rituals and things, whatnot. That's all been done for all time. So our conscience is clear. We know we have this access. Okay. Now, imagine this next one. You know, imagine who this audience is for the preacher that he's writing this, this sermon letter is probably Jewish converts to Christianity. So you've been raised your whole life Jewish. You've been raised your whole life not to eat any unclean foods, to you know, constantly be washing different things to make sure they're clean, to make sure you go through all the steps at Passover, to make sure that you don't break the bones of the lamb, to make sure if there's anything left over the next day, you burn it, uh, and that kind of thing to make sure anything unclean in the offerings is outside, uh, outside the temp boundary of the tent and burned. Uh, so you are used to having this, this support network of priests to do all these things. So you're just an ordinary person, common people. So now you're right, a passage from being a common person is because of the our consecration, our, our 
sanctification or making, making us holy by Jesus and by Jesus' body as a sacrifice, okay, now we can stand right next to him in service, right? We don't have to have, again, this whole superstructure to approach God and ask for forgiveness. We go right to the source. So we are a high priestly people because formerly that was the high priest that did that. You know, he offered, he sacrificed the, the scapegoat for the sins of all the nation on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus sacrificed himself as the atoning sacrifice. So as with him as our high priest, we are with him a high priestly people. Not that we're, everybody's a minister or anything like that, although we are kind of, we'll talk about that. Uh, but high priestly people, meaning we have that same access to God that the high priest had. So we have this heavenly calling where we are called to serve. We can draw near to him because we are Christ's brothers. That is the, that is who this is all about. So we go from being common people to being brothers of the Lord himself. So 1014 is a good verse for that. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Then look back at two, well not looking back because we haven't got there yet, two, 10 to 12. So 2, 10 to 12 says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. We'll keep hitting these key verses over and over. Notice how they're repeating. Uh, and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, I declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took on not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Okay, so Jesus can literally call us brothers because he literally became a human being, you know, descended from Abraham, descended from the first Adam, just as we are. So he can confidently call us brothers. We can confidently call him brother. Uh, wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Right. Then our fifth state is one we're probably maybe a little more familiar with, that our preliminary state is we are slaves to the devil. You know, we are born that way. You know, in our earthly life, we are slaves of the devil, and our rite of passage is death. That's how we cure. That's how that's cured. We have to die. Uh, we die the first death in baptism, when our old sinful nature is drowned. Even though it's still around, we're still sinners, but it's begun. But again, that completion, that consecration, consummation, does not happen until we die. So our final state then is our life of heavenly glory and we get to participate literally in person in the heavenly divine service. So we begin our earthly life as slaves of the devil, but when it's all done, we are God's sons. So Hebrews 2.10, which we've heard three times already tonight, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And then 12.5. So 12.5, 7 and 8. So 12.5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the ch chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And 
But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. You gotta love the King James. Sometimes things were really, really clear in the King James that just didn't, we kind of lost. Other things are, are hard to understand. But. And then verse, uh, chapter 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So, that's a good one. So what did the blood of Abel do? Remember what, hap what happened? Cain killed Abel. And God asked Cain, what did you do? And God said, his blood cries out to me. All right, so what was that? 1223, right? So 1223? No, yeah, no, 24. All right, so the mediator of the new covenant, the blood of sprinkling, the blood that was shared on the cross, that blood speaks much better things than the blood of Abel, right? The blood of Abel cries out, where's justice? Where is, you know, where is your vengeance? Where is what, you know, the first murder? The blood of Jesus cries out something much different and much worse, right? So it's like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But look what that blood did. Okay, so slaves to the devil become God's sons, only, uh, only completed by the rite of passage of death. Okay, and then the last one, and this one is kind of titled funny, but our preliminary state is aliens in this world. Like aliens in this world. Why did he choose to call it that? Uh, but we think about how we're called to be in, not of the world. So we're in the world. We're not supposed to be of the world. We have to live in it. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with all the people in it. But we're aliens here. Well, you know, we're different as Christians. You know, we're, we're strangers in a strange land, right? So the rite of passage for us then as aliens would be to journey to your homeland, uh, which again begins in baptism. So the journey to our homeland, to God's city, begins in baptism with the final state being recipients of the royal inheritance uh, in the citizens of the heavenly city. So we are all the faithful are all co-heirs of everything that belongs to Christ. So if we look at 1140 to 122, this is a good example of where chapter breaks are in weird places. So God having provided some better thing for us that they should that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we start to see how all these verses start to connect together. So we as co-heirs, uh, goes all the way back to 1-4 now. So being made, talking about Christ, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And that also belongs to us. And then chapter 3, verse 4, for that, yeah. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And then 6, 11, 12. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you not be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then chapter 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. And then 9.15, Thank you. 
And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then finally, 11.9. By faith, he sojourned. Actually, we should go back to eight. Actually, we should go back to seven. So, by faith, Noah, being uh, warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which the world, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And then we all come, then we come full circle. We see that idea of this being alien, being stranger in a strange country, foreshadowed in the Old Testament by Abraham. And then we kind of see how that applies here to us, and then how our rite of passage is passing through this existence, through the veil of tears, through the mortal coil, whatever you want to call it, through this life. And then once we reach heaven, then our final state is we inherit the royal inheritance as brothers of Christ. That is probably a good place to start. stop. Unless you want to talk about Melchizedek for a few minutes. So like I said earlier, and actually there's a, if you want to grab a copy of it, I just printed out where um, Hebrews is used in the lectionary during the church here. And most of the book is covered, uh, but there's some interesting places that are not. So uh, parts of chapter 5, parts of chapter 6, all of chapter 6 is not in there. Uh, all of chapter 8 is not in there. Part of 9, part of 10 part of 12, part of 13. But the, the one that is not in there is, and I think that's chapter 5, is Melchizedek. Yeah, chapter 7. 7? Yeah, because there's only 23 through 28 of chapter 7. Yeah. And the 7 is like everything Melchizedek. Yeah, so it's weird because we don't read that in church. And it's, I don't know, I think it, I think Melchizedek's a pretty interesting guy. For, for somebody that we only have like four verses about in the Old Testament, he's pretty interesting. So you actually have to go back to 620. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now that's pretty interesting right there. So when you first read that, it really, wa it really wants to tell me that Melchizedek is a pre-incarnation of Christ. It's a manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, but it's not. I really want it to be. But it's like, eh. No. But that whole without father, without mother, without descent, having either beginning of days nor end of life, I think that actually comes from uh, like some Assyrian notions of kingship. Uh, so they're borrowing from other cultures there. So you guys know where Salem is, right? So Salem's Jerusalem, right? So he's the king of Jerusalem. But he's also a priest. So he's a king and he's a priest. And he comes out to meet, uh, to meet, uh, I'm going to say it right, to Moses, right? Abraham, Abraham, Abram before he was Abraham, Abram. So he comes out to Abram after Abram was a general. So he pulls his Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Clone Wars, Star Wars now. So, so he had his first role as, as, a, as a war general, and then he comes out. The King of Salem comes out, weird to begin with. Kings don't come to you. You go to the king. 
Kings don't come out to you. Okay. So the king comes out to him, the king of peace, a little on the nose. So the king of peace comes out to him, and what does he give him? Anybody remember what he gave him? Bread and wine. Foreshadowing. So Melchizedek comes out as a king to Abram and feeds him bread and wine. The king of peace feeds him bread and wine. And then blesses him and sends him on his way. And that's all we know about him. That's it. But he is a type. He's a foreshadowing of Christ because he's a priest and he's a king. And the only other one you have like that is David. Who is high priest priest and king. Uh, Other than that, it doesn't happen. You don't mix, you know, just separation of church and state. They're mixing stuff there, right? You know, you got the kingdom on the left, the king on the right, boom, in one person. So I think Melchizedek's interesting because he crosses those lines and guess, well, guess what? Jesus is our great high priest and king, and guess what? He comes to us. That's why I don't like that part of our liturgy that says lift up your hearts in the communion liturgy because that actually comes from the Book of Common Prayer. It comes right out of uh, Calvinist we can't ascend to we heaven doesn't come to us we have to spiritually rise to heaven when we have the lord's supper it's like no that's not what's happening heaven comes to us heaven comes to us it's backwards but that that's why we say lift up your hearts because that's when everybody's hearts go to heaven and participate yeah it's not helpful it doesn't it doesn't teach anything well but that's where it comes from and it's still in the liturgy to this day so there you go liturgy trivia Uh, so yeah so Jesus comes to us he feeds us his body and blood and he blesses us gives us the benediction right in our divine service so it's exactly what this Melchizedek character is doing except at a much higher scale so I think Melchizedek's neat okay any questions I know that was a lot of stuff, but there's big themes that we have to hit, and then the rest of the book will be a lot easier, I think, because then they'll, we'll, it'll jog our minds when we see those words. Uh, so. so then next time we will be at... Yeah, so next time we'll start with chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. And we will look at, uh, again, we'll look at another thematic thing before we do those verses. We'll look at Jesus as our high priest in contrast to Israel's high priest. Um, A little different than uh, what we talked about tonight. But a little lighter, too. It's not as as, uh, dense as what we did tonight. Then we'll talk about verses 5 to 18. We did that, we did that, we did that. And then we will talk about, finally, then we will talk about, yikes. Uh, Then we'll talk about Christians as co-priests with Christ. Uh, And we'll look at the ways, after we talk about all this stuff, then we'll talk about how, how do Christians resemble, and that's where you guys get to do some detective work. So how do Christians resemble the old covenant priests and how do we differ from them significantly so compare and contrast modern christians with old testament priests so that's where we're going and then we'll be back in the book and again i'm going to follow only the texts that are covered in the church year uh, which is still most of the book so we'll do that and that'll be it when we start chapter 3, that's good because that's coming up. That's uh, trans- the text for transfiguration for year C is chapter 3, 1 to 6. Well, we only have like, isn't it two weeks before? Yeah, it's like the week after, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. Is this the fourth? Wednesday. I think there's two Wednesdays, two Thursdays. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's February 17th is Ash Wednesday.
No, no, we're not going to get that far. But we're going to get all these themes under our belt. And then when we come back after the break, then we can hit the rest of the book. I think it'll work pretty good. It's amazing to find out when you start studying this book, like how many themes, parallel themes are going through the whole thing. It's like, man, until you start reading some of the commentary sometimes, you just like, yeah, you've read it how many times, but you don't think, oh, this priest thing is a theme. Mm -hmm. And then perfection is a theme. It runs all the way through the book because we get it scattered throughout the church year. Like maybe in the season of Pente after Pentecost, you get a couple mini places where you get three, four, five weeks of Hebrews as the epistle reading. And you just kind of go boom, 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 boom. And then you never hear it again until, you know, Transfiguration, Christmas. There's a Lent one. Uh, then there's one for Saint Day, the uh, purification of Mary and presentation of our Lord. There's the text, the epistle text. Uh, so it's kind of scattered. So, so it's kind of good to, to read through the whole book. Anyway, that's enough of that. Let us uh, go ahead and close tonight with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.